What's up guys, my name is Kelvin Wiley and welcome to my YouTube channel. If you are new, if you could please hit that subscribe button and also hit the bell icon to turn on post notifications, that way you're alerted every time that I post a new video. So in today's video, I'm going to be showcasing Theraphosa apophysis, which is the Pinkfoot Goliath bird eater. I'm basically just going to be giving out general information about the tarantula as well as showing you how to build a basic, suitable enclosure for one. So without further ado, let's get right into the video. Say hello to my juvenile female Theraphosa apophysis, a pinkfoot goliath bird eater. Now these tarantulas are in the genus Theraphosa, which contains the largest species of tarantula on the planet, which is Theraphosa blondi, whose common name is the goliath bird eater. Now although Theraphosa apophysis is not the largest species of tarantula, it is still quite one of the larger ones. They will reach a leg span of about 12 inches when fully mature. The females, such as the one that I'm holding in my hand, can live around 20 years, while the males only live about three to five years. A huge, huge difference. The Pinkfoot Goliath bird eater is classified as a new world species of tarantula. If you're not familiar, there are two different types of tarantulas. There are new world tarantulas and then there are old world tarantulas. New world tarantulas are tarantulas that are native to North and South America. And then old world tarantulas are tarantula species native to Africa, Europe, Australia, and Asia. So when it comes to most new world tarantula species, and I say most because not all new world species of tarantulas have this, but the vast majority do, are urticating hairs. Now urticating hairs are these tiny little fine hairs right here that are located on the abdomen of most new world tarantula species. Urticating hairs are almost like fiberglass. So if the pinkfoot goliath bird eater, let's say it felt threatened, she would actually use her hind legs to rub her abdomen, which will essentially kick these tiny hairs off of her abdomen and they become airborne. They literally flick off of her. And when these hairs end up, let's say, landing on the skin of a human or in the fur of an animal, they can cause some serious irritation, itchiness. Um, they could potentially cause a rash. These hairs are a lot more serious if they enter the nasal passage or even enter the eyes where they can cause temporary blindness. Uh, they can might even scratch the cornea, but these hairs are not to be messed with um, in close proximity. So really quickly, I just wanted to share with you guys some stickers that I have for sale on my website. All of these are of various animals that I drew on paper, and then I converted those drawings into stickers. Just to give you an idea of what they look like up close, all of these stickers are extremely durable, they're long lasting, and they are also waterproof as well. This is of a Southern Black Widow that I drew, and as you can see, these are all legit hand drawings that I've made using those markers right there. So if any of you would like to support my small business, you can head on over to kelvinwiley.net. Again, that is kelvinwiley.net. I appreciate every single one of you. Thank you for supporting my website, but also supporting this channel as well. And now, back to the video. Now the flicking of urticating hairs is really their second line of defense. Their first really is to run, run from a potential predator. Their second is to flick their urticating hairs. And then the last one, if all else fails, they will use their venomous bite. They will resort to a bite. Now, like I just explained, there are two different types of tarantulas. There are new world and old world tarantulas. But there are also three different, I guess you could say, categories of tarantulas. There's fossorial, there's terrestrial, and there's arboreal. Now these three different categories of tarantulas um, will greatly depend on how you take care of them and what setup that you will use, mostly on the setup of enclosures. So fossorial tarantulas are tarantulas that primarily live underground. 
These are tarantulas that will dig and basically spend most of their lives um, unseen under, under the uh, substrate. And then there are terrestrial tarantulas, which are uh, what the pink foot goliath bird eater would be in that falls under the terrestrial category. Oops. <laughs> um, these are tarantulas that basically live not underground necessarily. They live above, they live above ground. Um, they will definitely, if you put out a burrow for them or kind of You'll see when I build the enclosure, uh, they don't necessarily dig, but they will spend basically their life above the ground, not like underground, like fossorial tarantulas. They live basically on the surface of the ground. And the third category is arboreal tarantulas. Now arboreal tarantulas are tarantulas that don't live typically on the ground. Uh, they live primarily on and also inside of trees. Now, these tarantulas are by far the most skittish in terms of handling. Uh, they, <laughs> they can cause some problems if you try to go and handle them because they are lightning fast. And if you are not quick enough, they can easily get lost in your homes. Believe me. <laughs> um, not that I've, I've lost an arboreal species in my home before, but I have had one escape on me but i ended up finding it thank goodness but um yeah these tarantulas are not recommended really for handling unless it's for like short use like if you're going to record like you know 30 second video uh, go for it i guess but it's not really practical Ter uh, terrestrial species are by far more manageable to handle than arboreal and even fossorial species some of them could be very finicky as well and so now I am going to show you how to build a proper, basic, easy enclosure for Theraphosa apophysis, otherwise known as the Pinkfoot Goliath bird eater. Now the first thing that you're going to want is your enclosure. Now because we have a terrestrial species, you're going to want to use a wide enclosure. Uh, a good rule of thumb is terrestrial species, you're going to want to use something that is more wide than it is vertical. Arboreal species, you're gonna to wanna to use something that is more vertical than it is wide. Now, the size of your enclosure really all depends on the size of your tarantula. If your spider is, you know, a sling, um, you're gonna obviously wanna use something much smaller than this. Fully mature, something larger than this, because my spider is neither, you know, a super small baby, but also not fully mature, we're gonna use something kinda of in the middle. So this will, suffice for her size. Now as you can see I've already added my substrate ahead of time. I prepped it just so just to save the few minutes that it would have taken me in the video to make uh, but I've already skipped ahead and added it and made it moist. The way to do that is you're just going to want to pick a substrate of your choice. That could be either peat moss or coconut fiber. Anything that will provide humidity in its enclosure. You are then going to want to get some water. Now I'm only gonna pour a little bit of water because I've already, like I said, made this ahead of time. But you're gonna wanna pour some water here and there and then you're just gonna mix it in. You know, use two hands, mix it in all, make sure it gets all evenly distributed throughout the substrate. And then you're gonna wanna test the substrate by squeezing it. If any water drips out, then that means you have added way too much water. Just, you know, squeeze it out on the side just to get all the water out, you know, put in a bucket, whatever. Um, but just make sure then when you go and squeeze it, no water comes out and that, that, that's a good uh, substrate that you've made. It's nice and cool, no water, because too much water will cause mold, um, bacteria to grow, fungi, all that kind of stuff. So you do not want that in your enclosure at all. And yeah, there's about four to five inches of substrate in this, uh, give or take. What you're gonna wanna do is you are going to push to the side um, the substrate, just making one side a lot higher than the other, kind of like a, a divot that kind of like dips down and gradually goes up. And I will show you why in a second that I'm doing this. I also, I didn't mention, there's also a uh, sphagnum moss and some hard hardwood leaves in here as well. You can put that in there. Um, I just, I like to do that. 
it's optional, but the sphagnum moss will definitely provide um, and retain some humidity in the enclosure. So just want to go, you're going to want to do something like this. You see how it kind of goes down and comes up just like that. All right. All right. Next, we're going to get a hide. This is going to be something that your spider will kind of just hide under. Uh, provides a feeling of protection from them so they're just not out in the open and we're gonna push that actually right in here okay and then we're gonna cover the kind of the top of it maybe like halfway all right it doesn't have to look pretty you can obviously get a little bit more fancy with it if you want but this part that leaves uh, the entrance to the hide is going to want to be a little like flat and kind of gradually go down just like that and so it's going to look something like that i know it's a little dusty and you might not be able to see it that well but it's gonna it's basically going to be like that so next what we're going to get is some dry substrate now you are actually going to pour a thin layer of dry substrate on top of your moist substrate. This species, like I said, does well with humidity, but they will thrive best if you add a layer of dry substrate on top of the moist substrate. Um, I find this to be very crucial for the uh, thriving of this particular species. So I'm just going around and providing a dry layer like this. Just to give you a quick overview of what it's looking like so far. So you have the deep moist substrate and then on top you have some bone dry substrate. Uh, underneath of the burrow, like inside of it, it could be moist, that's no big deal. It's just really the outside of the enclosure. And then like a pizza, we are going to kind of decorate our enclosure, adding some toppings. So I have some more sphagnum moss and some hardwood leaves. We are just going to kind of place and just kind of scatter throughout the enclosure like this. All right. Next, we are going to add our water dish. Now, the water dish um, really just varies upon the size of your tarantula. Um, if your tarantula is super small, obviously go with something much smaller than this because it can possibly drown, especially if you don't place anything inside of it. So really, if your tarantula is super small, your water dish should have some stones in it. Um, like you know little tiny like pebbles or whatever just to keep your spider afloat so it does not go and dropping down to the bottom of the dish and drowning so this she's fine she will not drown in this so I'm gonna place this in the corner and then pour my filtered water in the cap lastly we are gonna add our new tarantula to her brand new enclosure Now that she's in her new home, I am going to try to attempt to feed her. Now, Pinkfoot Goliath bird eaters are voracious eaters. They are not picky by any means. I usually have no trouble in trying to feed them. Now, feeding your tarantula um, really depends, again, a lot of things depend on the size of the tarantula. Um, the size that she's at now, she is usually very hungry all the time. Um, if you have one that's smaller, uh, much smaller, it may only eat maybe like once a week. Um, but she definitely has a big insatiable appetite. You can feed them anything from crickets to mealworms to cockroaches to uh, superworms, whatever you want. I mean, I'm going to try to give her a tomato hornworm, so let's see how that goes.
So that is going to conclude today's video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, if you could please leave a like and a comment, and also subscribe if you haven't done so already. Hit that bell icon and turn on post notifications. Follow me on Instagram at Kelvin Wiley and also on TikTok at Kelvin underscore Wiley. Also, feel free to check out my website, KelvinWiley.net, and I will see you guys in the next video.